Um, so, Jeremy, this is uh, the second of our um, uh, podcasts. We're going to talk about a, a little different subject today. Um, and uh, again, I'll give you have you give a brief introduction, to introduce yourself, uh, tell everybody about yourself because, uh, like I say, this is our second second podcast. So, go ahead. Right. So, my name is Jeremy Simeon. I'm a Louisiana Creole. Uh, I'm a collector, art collector, uh, with a special focus on Louisiana material culture and even a more specialized focus on 19th century portraits pertaining to Creoles of color and, uh, and Louisiana. So. Yeah, and uh, I'm Nick Douglas, and I'm the author of uh, Finding Octave and Reclaiming Black History. Um, I am a regular contributor for Afropunk um, and, you know, a cr kind of a Creole historian. Um, today, Jeremy and I, we're going to talk a little bit about... Um, some of the stuff that surrounding the, the, the Creole uh, quadrant ball and, and, and some of the mythology that's around that. So, you know, uh, one of the things that we, we wanted to, to, to highlight was um, first this Costa picture. Um, this Costa picture uh, was painted by Miguel Cabrera. Back in 1763. Um, and it's it's been used uh, on and off by by uh, by, by scholars uh, and genealogists to as sort of an example of uh, racial designations. Um, but um, I think that uh, many people have used it in the wrong way. Um, the racial designations on it are obviously very unscientific, um, and uh, they were created for. Uh, 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 some different purposes. First, they were commissioned by the Viceroy of New Spain, um, and um, those casts that are on there uh, were um, used to for for economic reasons. So um, the lower castes were um, uh, required to give more tributes and taxes to the state and church, which mm -hmm. a lot of people don't know about. Um, now Miguel Cabrera uh, painted this in 1763, and that's a sort of an important um, date in Louisiana history. But uh, Jeremy, I know you know some history about this 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 portrait uh, that, that I don't know, and I, I, I would appreciate you kind of sharing that with everybody. <clears throat> like you were saying, uh, you see these pretty much everywhere, and they were copied and copied and copied. So they were copied by many artists. Uh, typically, they're in a set of 16, um, and there are some, a, a few uh, remaining sets uh, complete sets, but there are a lot of incomplete sets. Uh, they're interesting paintings visually, obviously, to look at, uh, but to be perfectly honest, and as we've said before, they really have, uh, have they're completely f fictitious as far as, as far as designation, racial designation. Uh, they're, they're really, I, in my eyes, I see them more as novelty, uh, although, as you were saying, they were used for uh, as a hierarchy for taxation, and basically, in people with a uh, lower percentage of Spanish uh, blood uh, were taxed higher, and it really was just, a, as it said, a caste or a caste system. And uh, I think it really came out of the 16th century, uh, from when the Spanish were conquered by the Moors. I think it's their way of kind of. Uh, uh, making margins onto who got into what society. I'm not sure how much it was actually followed, kind of like what happened in Louisiana when the Spanish got here, but I think they, they felt more comfortable having this system and selectively applying it. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, it, 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 really, it, it really translated back uh, to the United States even because, um, in, you know, in pre-colonial uh, U.S. And, 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 and colonial U.S., um, states charged, uh, um, I, I consider not not taxes, but fines for free people of color. So free people of color were actually taxed at a higher level uh, than than people who were or who were who were white uh, in states like Tennessee and Virginia, uh, just as a matter of course. Um, so you know, um, and and and, and uh, some of the some of the designations, obviously, we have uh, you know quaternions and and moriscos. Which is which is their version of octoroon in in in, in Spanish language, um, and then you know there's uh, a, a term that's even up used today a cholo, which is uh, one Indian parent and one mestizo parent, and chino, which is uh, uh, short for cochino, which means pig, 
uh, which is a mulatto and an Indian. So um, really not a not something that we should be holding up as any kind of a um, litmus test for, for racial designations. Um, I, I think, um, you know, this kind of leads us into the next topic we're going to talk about, which is, which is the quadrant balls. Um, you know, uh, New Orleans uh, has a history of being a, a musical city, and I mean, starting from, from its very in, uh, initiation. Uh, Congo Square, obviously, was a, a place where slaves congregated um, at the back of the city at, on, on Rampart Street. Um, and uh, they were allowed to congregate there every Sunday uh, for many years, having an open market um, and buying and selling and trading, dancing um, and, uh, you know, uh, socializing as part of Code Noir, which was, uh, 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 which, you know, designated a, a one day a week uh, for them to have free. So, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, I know you know this history, Jeremy, um, but, um, you know, the, the, the quadrant balls obviously are something that came out of it. And, and, and you know, we, we were, you know, we've gone back and forth about this. Obviously, we've talked about this subject before. Um, but um, they started very early on. And uh, I'll um, share a, um, uh, on a very early article from 1805. Um, that was in the uh, uh, the Monitor de, de la Louisiane, in, um, that, that is a ball. Uh, it, it doesn't specifically say quadrant ball, uh, but it is for a, a ball for uh, femme de, de color libre. So, um, you know, uh, it's obviously a, a ball that was set up, but, um, uh, you know, again, we get, in, we get into this situation where we, we have a, a, a racial designation of quadrant, and, you know, Jeremy, um, you know, I, I, I know you have some thoughts about this. So, you know, I mean, let, let's talk about this quadrant thing. And you, I, I want to hear what you have to say about it. Sure. And, you know, I mentioned with the cast of paintings that a lot of these designations were ridiculous. Because I, even the idea of quadrant, most of the people referred to as a quadrant were not actually quadrants. Meaning that they were, you know, one-fourth, like three-fourths European ancestry. So the term quadrant ball, when we talk about that, uh, you know, I, I honestly don't believe there were uh, true quadrant balls, uh, as we hear about with the, I think they were really kind of an Anglo invention. That is not to say that New Orleans did not have a ball every Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and uh, any, any other, or probably not Sunday, because the Catholic city, but because as you were saying, the city revolved around entertainment. The Creoles were into conspicuous consumption. They were interested in living life to the fullest. And I think that's because in a colonial society, uh, you know, death was always right at your door. Mm -hmm. So they lived life to the fullest. And any excuse for a party, uh, they, were, they were happy to do that. They were ready to open up their homes, take out the best silverware, uh, the best wine you could. Uh, you could buy and serve it to their friends. Uh, in fact, uh, there's even early inventories, uh, ship logs that talk about how the Creoles spent so much money on uh, buying imported, uh, you know, liquors, wines, and soaps to give to their friends and all this. Mm -hmm. uh, but when we get to balls, and when we talk about a quadroon ball, a place where uh, women who were classified as quadroons were there uh, for the selection of European men, I, I think that it's pr it's pretty obvious that that those simply did not happen, and uh, <clears throat> you know, in any instance that references uh, or alludes to something like that, was most likely a very uh, uh, I'll say a, a, str a strategic way to get some. Uh, uh, new blood visitors into the city to uh, in a careful disguise for prostitution. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and you know, uh, I, I I have to say um, that uh, you know I I, I have a, um, a, a document which we'll, we'll, we'll talk about, um, and it, you know it, it, it's a it's a it's an advertisement for a quadrant ball. The only one I've ever seen that said quadrant ball on it. Um, um, and um, you know I'm gonna um, uh, display that. Um, it, it basically is at a uh, at a spot 
uh, in New Orleans that was a notorious gambling spot, um, the Globe um, Ballroom. Um, and, uh, you know, these ballrooms obviously, you know, like you say in New Orleans, it was a musical city, people entertained, people had uh, parties, uh, there, was, there was a lot of socializing that was done, uh, especially among the free people of color. Um, and um, so, uh, you know, with New Orleans being such a musical city, there were always balls and always venues where people were dancing and music was was involved. And and my 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 uh, my relatives were some of the early early musicians that were were noted in in New Orleans. So um, you know we we have a situation where um, a, a fantasy is built up over the years. Now um, you know going back as far as Congo Square. Visitors from the north used to come to the Congo, come to right. Congo Square to see African dancing and African music. Um, back, uh, you know, at, at in the early 1800s, because it was an, an unusual thing. Um, they there were no congregation points where 500 or 600 uh, free people of color, black and black slaves, got together uh, unfettered to to uh, dance and sing and and. Um, it, that that was just unheard of in the in the north, uh, and so the you know the idea that they're uh, that they were able to keep up African dances, African language, um, was just completely uh, it was a a, a a tourist attraction, and right. um, and the balls became the same thing, and northerners from from uh, from all over the north came down to New Orleans in in this sort of heyday of these of these balls from the 1800s uh, on. Um, um, to to you know uh, try to participate and in, and in, in get into these balls, but what they were uh, really was uh, a tip, like you say, sort of a uh, uh, a a front for prostitution of of of, of slaves. Of, and so so um, you know one of the things that one of the things that we talk about when these quadrant balls and that early um, you know quadrant ball that we showed uh, back in the seventeen in seventeen eighty one. Um, you know, uh, these these there was um, legislation um, that was um, you know basically petitioning for for not allowing slaves to attend these balls and um, and so what was what was that about? Well, let's let's use to, just use our common sense. You know, if you have a slave going to a ball um, and uh, white men are being there uh, at these balls, uh, what 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 is what is the draw for them? Are they going to buy the slave? No, they're not going to buy the slave. Are um, are they there to socialize and with somebody of their uh, stature? No, that's not it. So so what is it? Can well, I say uh, a slave can make more money as uh, being a prostitute to white northerners than they can uh, you know working uh, a, a, as a laborer. So I think that that's one of the things. And some of the so some of the sort of early legislation that came out of that. Uh, I mean, really tells that that was one of the stories. So, um, you know, here in 1781, they made it illegal for slaves or, or either slaves or free people of color um, to to wear masks at these balls, right? Because, uh, and Jeremy, you had an interesting story about that. I, I, I think you should, you know, uh, tell me about that because, you know. Right, right. I, I seem to recall seeing a colonial document where they reference actually free people of color and say that they don't, they are not supposed to be wearing a mask. Because there was a report that some free people of color were sneaking into the homes of the prestigious white Creoles during Mardi Gras. I mean, that's the way to see how the other half lives. You put on a mask, you walk right in, and you get to uh, taste the best wines, eat the best food, <laughs> and you get to compare uh, lifestyles. You get to say, are we living this good? And, and some of them say, oh, we're living better than this. Yeah, but yeah, they, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Our food might be better. We're <laughs> living way better than this. But uh, I, I would have never known that from the street. Uh, so it was interesting, but to touch on what you were saying about uh, these these balls and where some of them uh, had had slaves coming in, and I don't believe it was just obviously the slaves were uh, up to their own uh, devices and of course weren't willing prostitutes. I think of course there was some exploitation, uh, of course with other uh, with their masters and everyone else, and and it was an organized ring. New Orleans has always, I think for as long as it's been a city, has been a place where uh, outsiders and tourists visit it. And I think these quadrant balls, uh, as well as a number of other attractions, were a way to get that money from those visiting people. And uh, they sensationalized. 
and they perpetuated the ideas uh, that these people had. You know, they said, okay, they want a quadrant ball, we're going to start having a qu quadrant ball. Uh, and uh, so this is something that New Orleans has also been always been a place I think where there's always been a level of hustling, <laughs> and uh, you know it's from the people who are singing on the street to tap dancing to uh, handing out flyers. Well, oh, you got to go to this club. They give you a free drink and they give you some uh, gumbo. Or there's a voodoo woman over here, over there, over there. They're gonna they're gonna play on whatever the tourists are are interested in. They're gonna play on what is taboo. And they're going to sell it to you. <laughs> well, New Orleans is a real city, and so things happen in the real cities. And um, right. so sometimes it's it's not good things that happen in real cities. And um, you know, uh, and and New Orleans is and still still is famous for this. Um, and so you know, um, like I say, um, we 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 need to take this this quadrant ball in in uh, in in stride and really really look at it and dissect it. Now. Um, I'll share a a um, a a, um, a a ball that that's a legitimate ball that's put on by the Société de Economie. And obviously, you see, this is a big difference between the the, the previous um, document that I shared. Um, and and it's it's a ball. It's a mask ball and costume ball. Um, and and you know it's it's just sim a very simple advertisement that was in the paper. Um, now this is a legitimate ball. We we know Society de de Economy was a legitimate um, meeting hall where creoles of color met. Um, obviously, this is they have entertainment there, and there were lots and lots of legitimate balls. But there were also a lot of balls that where a lot of illegitimate stuff was going on. Yeah, yeah, right. And so that previous, the previous document that we showed saying, you know, oh, there'll be police protection. Well, you know, on a grand fancy ball, why do you need police protection? You know, um, you know, it, it doesn't make sense. Um, saying that the women will get in for free. Well, that's, that's not how this works. Uh, you know, um, most of these balls and, and with, uh, with creoles of color were, were, were productions really to benefit things, uh, it, whether it's uh, benefit the, the, this, the, the, the hall that they were having it in, or a children's society, orphan society, hospital, school. Um, the reason for a lot of these balls was that during the, the, the period from after the Americans came in in, in 1800, they started to take away a lot of the services and, uh, and, uh, that uh, free people of color had enjoyed. Um, and they started to uh, make the separation of races um, much more uh, strict than it had been. Um, and so uh, a, lot of, a lot of New Orleans, white New Orleans as well as uh, black New Orleans inhabitants, were really pushed out of shape about this because they were used to mixing in any way that they felt comfortable. Uh, and many people felt comfortable with this. Um, one of the things about the, uh, these, you know, I, I was talking about the legislation to kind of stop uh, having mass balls, stop having slaves, be allowed to participate in these balls. It wasn't until 1828 that the city allowed uh, uh, mass balls again. So again, you know, we see that um, you know things changed, um, and 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 uh, these balls were, were happening. Um, so so one of the things that 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 we talk about back and forth is this, you know, um, just the common sense uh, knowledge about this. Is what people need to start taking into account. Taking into account. Now, in 1860, we're talking about a free people of color that are uh, are a very sophisticated group of people, artisans, business owners, property owners, um, many of them educated in in, uh, in France, and um, they're they're raising uh, their children up uh, in that this same manner, and they want their children to do better than them. Yeah. So um, it, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense that they would send their daughters um, who they've raised up to um, balls where white northern strangers are going to be there. Um, it, it, that doesn't make any common sense. Um, and, you know, we, we, we went back and forth about this, uh, you know, uh, and, 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 you know, I'll, 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 I'll let you chime in because I know you, I know you have a, a Sure. So so, so let's just hypothesize for a moment. Say you're one of these, a, a Creole father, and for some idea, let's just say for some reason, you want your daughter to be in a, a relationship with a European man 
because uh, for some reason you're unable to provide for, and you, for some other reason you can't find a free man of color, which there were many free men of color who could have provided for her in the same manner uh, that these uh, European or uh, as any other white man in the city could provide for a woman of color. But say there was a way that yeah, they, there was something, you were set on this and you wanted to do this for some reason. The way you wouldn't do this is to advertise in the newspaper or to bring her to an event uh, that's essentially like an auction. Uh, but say you wanted to, to do something like that, one, you would pre-qualify the people that were coming <laughs> to see your dog. Mm -hmm. You would say, open attendance, you're from Kentucky, come on in. Uh, you're, now you said you're a ship captain, you're sure about that? Uh, it, there would be pre-qualification, and, and I don't mean to lend to the idea that this happened, because this didn't happen like that. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not to say that there were not formal agreements between men and women, and I'm talking about both of color, uh, men, of, men and women of color, and men and women uh, uh, who were uh, white Creoles. There was formal agreements between most people in uh, when uh, getting into a marriage, and that's because women owned property and they had separate property. Uh, they were very, very specific about who was bringing what to the marriage. Um, but this is not this is not to be confused with the system of plissage, where or what is commonly referred to as plissage, because the word plissage is used and is is uh, I've heard uh, relatives of mine use, it, but it's a, it's not a it's not specifically uh, to refer to a person of color or a woman of color and uh, her her white uh, partner. It, it it's it means a place a place they found it white. And I mean, it's it's really become associated with quadrant balls. I mean, right? Uh, it, the plissage relationships came out of these quadrant balls, and that's what the quadrant balls were set up for. And I mean, right. so. and that's just not in, in, in these terms. These terms historically meant something different. Not that quadrant ball was a term thrown away, thrown around. This is just not something that uh, you know, other than what we talked about as a solicitation uh, to attract tourists and to attract outsiders, mm -hmm. uh, but. But again, to touch on, so say you did want your, your daughter for some reason to, uh, to uh, select a European man and, uh, and you needed, uh, she needed that patronage. You would certainly not op uh, have an open casting call where you just allow anybody in uh, to know about this. Uh, it, so, you have so access that, to your daughter. Mm -hmm. Right, to have access to your daughter. And uh, that right there should be, I mean, these people were sophisticated. They owned a third of the French Quarter, okay? They were a fifth of the population. Um, they weren't desperate people. I'm not to say, to say that all free people of color were wealthy people, okay? I'm not to say that certain relationships were not formed out of necessity with women of color and European men. Uh, that's, that's not to say that. I won't even go as far to say, uh, you know, some of these uh, women of color, of course, were, some of them, were mistresses of men of color. Uh, some of them were mistresses of of of, of white men. But uh, but what I'm what I'm trying to get at is th this this it was not a system. And I know that a lot of talk has been made because it's it's sensational, and it kind of builds on stories that tour guides have been telling about New Orleans for probably the last 80 or 100 years. It's been recorded in books by George Washington Cable. Uh, it's been told in stories like Tukatu or by, uh, I have a few books here, uh, Children of Strangers by Lyle Saxon. It kind of talks about this old Creole days. And okay, so wait, so wait a second. Now you, you're pulling out Lyle Saxon. Now Lyle Saxon was a, a Creole revisionist. He is a person that said Creoles are, are only white and French people at the turn of the century during the Jim Crow era. And so I, I understand why he is, I, I understand why he has that um, idea about the plissage. And I, um, you know, I mean, like I say, we really need to, to take this in, in the context of, of this. The quadrant balls are made up it's it's a fantasy it's it, it, um, I uh, so one advertisement that I've I've been able to find all the years that I've been here uh, that advertisement I showed that advertisement that actually says quadrant ball is really a front for for prostitution plain and simple as that um, now when we talk about plissage um, 
that's that's another thing. We we I mean, you know, anybody who who knows the history of, of Louisiana well knows that blacks, whites, Native Americans, they all mixed in in uh, in, in pre eighteen oh three Louisiana. Uh, there was a, a whole society that when the Americans came, they were uncomfortable with it. They were uncomfortable with the way we we were mixing with people and inter intermarrying and having open relationships, uh, living openly uh, blacks and whites together. They were uncomfortable with that. The Americans, did, they wanted to do everything to, to, to stop that kind of behavior. Um, and so, you know, when we, when we, and you know, my cousin, I'll go crazy if I, I, don't, I don't mention this. I have never seen one shred of evidence. I've never seen one document that was a plissage document. No, no. And, but which is unusual because there are plenty of marriage documents that clearly specify this person has this many R points, this person has this and this and this. There's there's documentation for everything, but somehow there's no documentation here. Yeah. And I, it you know so that that alone should should open the eyes of most people. Yeah, and and you know you think about it. Uh, you know the French were were uh, they were bureaucrats. I mean they they documented everything. So the fact that 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 not, that this doesn't exist is really uh, 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 telling. It, it, yes, yeah, telling. And and you know, like I say, it, we we know uh, we we've heard the word plassage. We've heard the yeah. word placé. You know, I mean, we we know that these words exist, but um, they they existed. I mean, I I I kind of I I, I kind of think about it like this too. Um, you know, uh, women that um, there was there was all kinds of choices to be made in, in Louisiana. There were uh, white men, black women, uh, Creole women, uh, Native Americans, mixes of every in individual, yeah. Spanish, French, uh, Italian, German. And so um, uh, people were mixing in all kinds of different ways. And so, um, you know, um, the, the idea that there was an organized um, uh, system among uh, free people of color or, or, or women that were uh, considered of mixed heritage to try to meet white men to have relationships with white men is absurd. Um, and, and simply because, like you say, of the economic factor that you're talking about. These guys, the, by, by the time we're talking about these Creole balls happening, uh, the, the Creoles in New Orleans, they were, they were wealthy people um, and sophisticated. And, and, and you know, the, the <laughs> you know, um, we, we get into this and like I say, it's been it's been so romanticized, uh, and there's been there's been so much uh, misinformation that's gone out. You know the movies that have been made and the, the Anne Rice books, the millions of dollars that have been made. And this is kind of what we were talking about, and you touched on over and over again about why we have to be in charge of our own narrative. See, so, I mean, for the most part, a lot of people of African descent in the last, we'll say, hundred years. Uh, didn't have access or a platform to talk about their family history and or uh, about their own lineage, uh, whether it was their culture, their creole culture, and other people stepped in and took that job from us, and they put forth things that we're still trying to scrub away. We have a lot of people who get very upset when someone says they're creole in Louisiana because we have we we've attached and affixed these things uh, such as colorism and other isms uh, to the word Creole. And there's a shame about saying you're Creole, and a lot of that is derived from the ideas that these Creoles were nothing but social climbers who, uh, women, uh, women of color social climbers who needed white patronage. This is the craziest thing. Uh, and let me tell you something, you hear about free women of color all the time. You can go to take a tour of New Orleans right now and they'll tell you some tragic story about, oh, the woman, uh, she wanted her white lover to marry her, so she climbs on the roof and, and uh, in, the, in the coldest day in uh, whatever, in winter, and she dies the next day and the building's still haunted. I heard this mm -hmm. less than a year ago. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they'll constantly talk about the quadroon women, the free the women. Tragic quadroon. Free Color. Mm -hmm. Where were the free men of color? Did did people of mixed ancestry or, or supposed Creoles of color, free people of color, were there no free men of color? It the the I the fact that they don't mention free men of color should sound suspicious already. Mm -hmm. what, who, who who did these free men of color marry? Did they marry anyone? Did they disappear off the face of the earth? 
No, they married free women of color. color. Exactly. And you know something, uh, Jeremy, this is this has hit home to me uh, very, very, very uh, hard because uh, I've had uh, a couple of different people uh, talk, up, write books about relatives of mine and trying to describe their lives and calling them tragic quadrants, which I, which I, I absolutely take issue with. Uh, I, I think that uh, the, the term quadrant should be quadroon, octoroon, mulatto. What, what is a mulatto? Is it a half white person, half black person? I, I guess I'm a mulatto because, you know, f uh, my DNA test is 50-50. But, um, you know, I, I have issues with that. I have issues with uh, people making up um, sort of fantasies to, to, to tintillate uh, people uh, who, are, who are ignorant about uh, uh, Creole New Orleans with uh, the idea that there was this sort of uh, verboten mixing of races when we know in, in, in Creole, Louisiana, it was not, that was not a big deal. People crossed over the color line anytime they wanted. Some people, uh, you know, black, white, they just crossed the color line, Native American, they didn't care. Um, and, and I actually had, I actually confronted somebody about this. Um, and, I, and I said, you know, hey, you can't use that term. That's a derogatory term, and certainly don't use it about my relatives. Um, and and this is somebody who considers themselves to be a scholar who will go unnamed. Um, and they actually said uh, to me that, um, hey, um, saying that they're a quadrant or octroon makes it easier for me to classify them. And and so uh, the idea that somebody would say they are Creole, and you have to figure out what that is, was was too much. I mean, why should why should our racial identity be easy for somebody why should why should why should uh, uh, I, I classify myself so that I can make it easy for somebody who's supposedly a scholar and studying me or my my culture why should I make it easy for them um, so I, I, I from the cast of paintings again uh, again the designation and the enumeration or uh, of, of white ancestry or black ancestry or native ancestry or anything else this is not something the natives cared about. It's not something the people of African descent cared about. This is something that uh, was really, really under the idea of white supremacy. Um, and these are the, these sort of ideas are only important to people who are interested in perpetuating the system of white supremacy. Mm -hmm. Because I can identify as a man of color. I can say I'm a man of African descent. And other people uh, who are of African descent say, okay, okay, no problem. Mm -hmm. But people who ask questions or who are most interested, most times they're not interested in the culture, uh, they want to know percentages, and then they want to know the specifics, the stories. Why is that? It's because they want to put you in a hierarchy. Yeah, they, they want, want, they to, want to, yeah, see where you fit in. to these 16 pictures. Mm -hmm. And that's why I kind of said earlier on, you asked me about the cast of pages, I just said, well, you know, they're kind of ridiculous. Because as interesting as they are visually, uh, they're a novelty. I mean, it's it's they're, be they're beautiful paintings. They are. They are beautiful. Yeah, they're beautiful paintings, and I mean, um, and so let you know. I I, I think I'm I'm going to go back a little bit to that to that 1763 date. That's when the Spanish took over uh, Louisiana, and they ruled Louisiana right till the Louisiana Purchase in 1803. And um, a lot of um, uh, they they brought in coartacion, which is uh, right. freeing of, of free people of color, uh, a way for you to buy yourself out of. Uh, uh, slavery. They did not believe in uh, slavery in perpetuity, which, uh, which right. you know, the Americans. I mean, that probably freaked them out more than anything. But um, the Spanish had a way. Go ahead. Permanent condition. It was not That's a permanent condition. Yes. People to hear that. The Americans and some and some of the other people who enslaved people believe that slavery. Once you're a slave, you're you're tainted. And this is again not to say that the Spanish were completely no, trans. Know. They have, they have they have as much blood on their hands as anybody, right? Yeah. Right, mm -hmm. but they did not see slavery as a permanent, uh, a permanent state or situation, and this could have come from their own history with the 16th century, with when we talk about the Moors, and I think this is why they were hypersensitive of race again with these paint, or one of the reasons why they may have been sensitive to race, uh, because they weren't so far off from some of these classifications mm -hmm. themselves, but. Uh, Okay, so so the the only the, the other thing I wanted to talk about, I, like I say, I talked about family members, um, and and um, I'm I'm you know not naming names about this, but um, you know uh, Henrietta de, de Leon, I I'm, I'm a um, uh, 
are related to Henrietta de Leo. And she is really associated with uh, the quadrant balls and plissage. And people, there's a mythology out there that her mother groomed her to be a place and she rebelled and, you know, became religious and, father, uh, you know, founded the, the uh, Sisters of the Holy Family. Um, there, I've never seen one shred of evidence to show that that's true. Her mother was committed. Now, I understand that that, that there's some documentation around that. So, obviously, she had some mental problems. So, I don't know how a person with mental problems can be training somebody to be a placé. Um, and so, you know, um, you know, we're, we're you know, uh, people at the, in the Catholic Archdiocese are, are trying to, uh, you know, make sure that Henrietta de Leo moves along that progression to be a saint. And I, I believe that she is. I mean, the work that she did is, is fabulous. I'm, not, I'm saying that as, I'm, of course, I got my, my own prejudice about that, but um, the work that she did, I mean, the, the Sisters of the Holy Family are still existent. They, they still, they're still helping people now. So, um, you know, we need to, we need, I, I want to disconnect her from that. Let's, 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 let's throw that out. She was never. Uh, well, I think it also, it also limits the sacrifices that she actually made to be who she was. Because when you tell the world that, well, you know, she had one choice. She could either be a rented, for lack of a better word, a prostitute or, or whatever else mm -hmm. you want to call it in a nice way. Or uh, she could do this. Well, it, it doesn't make it as uh, it doesn't it doesn't actually show the actual weight of what she did. This woman had ability. She could have done many things. She could have lived a life of uh, leisure. She could have uh, you know been attending balls, uh, raising children, or having servants raise children. She could have moved to France. She could have moved to other pl other places. Instead, she didn't. She put that behind her, and she decided to try to help people who are less fortunate than her. And so when you throw uh, uh, the idea that she uh, was, either, her choice was either to form, you know, go and do what other women uh, of color did and, and attend, uh, you know, become the mistress of some white man or do what she did, people are not seeing what she actually turned away from. She turned away from a, a life of, uh, uh, a, a, or could have turned away from possibly the life of, of, of luxury and leisure. She could have married a wealthy free man of color, uh, and, and that's really, really important to think about. Mm -hmm. I think the Catholic Church has try, tried their best in, uh, to share her true story, but unfortunately, uh, a few things have gotten in the way. One, a rather terrible movie. I think it was a TV-made movie. I won't uh, name the name of it, but it starred a, a, a you know a, a rather interesting uh, celebrity um, who, of course, was not without scandal herself. There were some issues in the 1980s, uh, but not, I'm not saying that to be me. But I, I'm just saying I think that they probably thought of that when they cast the role, uh, cast her in the role of Red. But uh, and there's been some articles that have come out just recently. Um, that we're talking about, she attended many quadrant balls, may have had some illegitimate children, and I contacted one of the writers of this, and they apologized profusely, and uh, I said, well, no, don't don't apologize, show me source, I want to know where you got this yeah. from, mm -hmm. I want the documents, and again, they apologized, they even contacted someone else who shared, uh, and, and they were, uh, I don't want to get too specific, but they offered me tickets to some exhibits and they wanted to talk to me and, and uh, you know, treat me as an honored guest. I'm not interested in being an honored guest. I'm interested in uh, my history uh, uh, and, uh, and the elevation of people of African descent in Louisiana. I'm, I'm tired of, uh, of what has been going on, which is the exploitation of women of color uh, traditionally. And uh, even even today, we see women of color constantly exploited on television mm -hmm. and other and in other uh, forms. Uh, so I, I declined and said, "No, that doesn't work for me. I would like you to write another article and uh, apologize." They didn't want to do that. Um, and uh, and the problem with what I'm the problem with the article is it was shared I think 1,600 times last time I saw mm -hmm. on Facebook. So you have people reading this. And you have these ideas continuing to grow. These are not our stories, okay? These are stories from someone else looking in 
and filling in what they don't know. Right. And like I say, uh, things that are put out there without one shred of evidence. And that, yeah. and that really, that, that's what really bothers me. Um, and, um, you know, uh, like I say, uh, because my family has been there so long, uh, a lot of people have uh, started to research my, my family members. Um, and, and, you know, I, I'm, in some ways I'm flattered. I think it's great that they should research my family members, but they should always tell the best story possible. And if, uh, if they, they, they don't have any information, just don't say anything. Don't make up some stuff. Just don't say anything. Say, I don't know this. But, but don't try to fill in the gaps by saying, oh, my relatives were, you know, tragic quadrants or that they were uh, being groomed to go to a, 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 a quadrant ball and be a plus A. I mean, that's, that's, that's just, that's, that's the worst kind of, that's the worst kind of uh, historical um, reporting that you can do is just making stuff up. Now, if you want to write a novel, write your novel. I don't care. If, write your novel, but but right, don't, it's all fiction. Yeah, right. Yeah, but don't name my don't name my relatives and say that they did this when you don't have one shred of evidence that to to back it up. And I think that you know, like I said, these quadrant balls. Um, we we I I I, uh, I spent a lot of time sort of deconstructing this, and you know, we 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 talked about this. I think that uh, you know, if if the message gets out that you know people start to realize that these are just uh, made up things and a lot and and of course there were balls um, but there are lots of legitimate balls and there were lots of illegitimate balls and the quadrant balls um, that uh, that that we're talking about some of them are just straight up fronts for prostitution of of of, of, of black slaves black slave women right and we and know less, less fortunate free women of color right right who found themselves in 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 uh, Bad situations, right? Which can happen to any women, uh, you know, any woman back then, you know. And and you know, we we know we know because uh, our relatives were free women of color, uh, what they did, and they were they were uh, businessmen, entrepreneurs. I mean, businesswomen, entrepreneurs. Um, they were movers and shakers. They made things happen in New Orleans. They they were business owners. They were they they had a a a, 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 a I mean, their their personal initiative is what drove New Orleans to become what it is. And so if we don't start acknowledging that and we start, uh, we continue to have these people calling us quadroons and octoroons and saying we went to quadroon balls and tried to uh, marry, uh, you know, uh, Europeans so that we could become lighter, that's, that's just, yeah. uh, that just defeats the whole purpose. I mean, um, right. and, and, well, so and I think it's important to mention because we do have to actually talk about <clears throat> there were relationships with some women, free women of color did have relationships with European men. And there were some, there were actually, and we can get into this because we have to be transparent about uh, yeah, about this, we have to own. There were some women who were, for lack of a better term, a mistress to European men. Now, you do have to remember that uh, many marriages were, were you know, uh, arranged marriages. So you, you see this a lot in Louisiana where cousins marry and cousin, and et cetera. So you had a lot of men who were married strictly because of, political, uh, economical reasons, and it was a loveless marriage, and you did see relationships with free women of color. You also saw relate, see relationships of, of European men having lifelong companionship and relationships with free women of color without having a, a wife or something like that. And these that's important to bring up because people say, well, yeah, but there were, there were in fact, women of color who were with with white men, and that that is absolutely true. Like you said early on, uh, there was a certain fluidness uh, of, of of races at, a, at at different periods, more so than others. But yes, th this did happen. And, yeah, and, uh, and uh, you know something uh, to deny that would be uh, uh, it, it would just be a, a lying to yourself. Um, right. Certainly, I have I have white French uh, rel white French grandfathers and grand and great grandfathers and. Um, who who lived openly with free women of color? Some who had uh, monogamous relationships. Some who had numerous relationships. I, right. I don't I don't try to cover that up. Uh, people right. did uh, 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 the 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 morality in in New Orleans was a bit different than what Protestants expected from the North, and so we we um, we're a little bit more accepting about uh, the relationships that people had and a little less judgmental about it. Okay. Okay. So, um, 
so so Jeremy, um, uh, you know, I um, like like I was saying, you know, I think we 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 talked about a a, a number of things here, um, and you know, uh, let's uh, I'll I'll I'll, uh, I'll kind of give you a a, a a parting shot here. Um, you know, we talked about the costas, we talked about the cost uh, quadrants, uh, octoroon balls, and quadroon balls, and we, we talked about the uh, plissage, and you know we 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 tried to, I, you know what I what I hope that people will do is try to, you know, fit this into the context of what New Orleans is about, and New Orleans is one of the most unique cities probably in the world, and there, that, this is why so many people come there. You know what I mean? Um, not because just because of its unique history, but just because of the unique feel of the place. And Louisiana, as a state, has this sort of unique feel. Um, and I know you're you're a longtime resident. Your your uh, your family has been there as long as mine, or maybe longer. Um, so you know, um, we need to when we when we start talking about these subjects, we need to put them in the context of history, right, and we right. need to put them in the context of Creoles. And and uh, again, you know, uh, uh, our our lifestyle was a little bit different, um, and then than a lot of Northerners were were used to. And so, because of that, um, there's there's a lot of misunderstandings, and and I think um, many of these people tried to mold our story into something that they could feel comfortable with, and and you know uh, just to, as, as kind of an aside here, when I when I um, confronted uh, these these scholars about calling my relatives quadrants, um, and you know making some false statements about them, I said, well, you know, okay, you're you're quarter English. What if I call you quadra English? And she, this person, got livid. She was livid, and I said, "Well, now you know how I feel about you calling my, my relatives quadrants. If you call them a Creole, I'm okay with that. You call them a black Creole, white Creole, I'm okay with that too. But you call them a quadrant. What the hell is that? You know, I mean, uh, it, it's like uh, saying mulatto. Yeah, yeah. You know." It's a good um, situation and a reminder uh, of, of, of a time where uh, white supremacy reigned. And, and some people say, well, it still reigns. But I'm, I'm saying where the, where the institution was uh, right there and the classification of people was is important simply for a hierarchy to figure out where you fit into the system. And uh, it's a problem. And just to touch again on our unique society in Louisiana, you know, we, we talk, we, they say these, they talk about these, obviously these quadrooms, the quadroon women and the idea of their mistresses and all that. And that's, that was very sensationalized for Anglos. It was sensationalized for people like that. But the reality is if you would have gone to France at the same time, you would have seen a wealthy man uh, with a mistress. If you would have seen the king of France, you would have had many mistresses. So not to say or say, well, it was okay in that society. But it was more prevalent in French society and Spanish society, and you're in that that those people, those those Europeans were more familiar with the idea of um, mistresses and this and that. I'm not saying that's what these real women of color were, but I am saying that it wasn't as since it wasn't as uh, exotic or uh, taboo in this in this world uh, as it was in the protestant world where which the same thing happened it just wasn't people weren't as aware of it mm -hmm. it was a different society and uh and i think people in new orleans were well aware of that and i do believe that a lot of these stories uh that came uh came out uh, of of these relationships were also uh perpetuated by um, jealous and angry white Creoles, because many of them, their fathers, did have heirs with, uh, you know, with women of color, and they had to split their inheritance, which they continually fought over. Mm -hmm. you know, oh yeah. And was widowed uh, many times. He would, he would uh, take up with a younger uh, woman, uh, and sometimes these women were of color, and uh, this infuriated, uh, infuriated most, uh, I guess, many of the white Creoles who had to share their inheritance. And uh, we see evidence of this, them constantly proposing pieces of legislation to limit the ability of people of color to inherit from white men. Yeah, and, and we know that that was, that was something that came with the Americans. And it, 
it got um, it became you know more and more uh, evident. And obviously, you know, we we had a, a sort of a like that book that you were showing by um, Lyle Saxton um, and and Charles Gray. And I mean, uh, there's there's quite a few people that that when we got into that Jim Crow era and and race was really like the paramount thing, and and they were trying to disenfranchise uh, blacks uh, or people of color from from having any kind of say in what was going on in the state. Um, this the 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 we had revisionists. We had people that said, you know, this is what a Creole is. And, you know, then later on we had, this is, we had Cajunization and then yeah, yeah. everything became Cajun. I never, I never, I mean, I grew up in a, a, a four generations of, 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 of Creoles in my family. I never heard the word Cajun. I never heard that word ever utter, uttered, but Most suddenly. Cajuns have heard it, the word yeah, Cajun. Yeah, uh, I mean. <laughs> The last you know, 50 years, yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, you know, um, we, we have these, these, these things that pop up. Uh, you know, the, the quadrant ball popped up in uh, the, the 19th century. Cajunization pops up in the 20th century. Right. There'll be something else later, you know. Um, but it's always something to try to, um, to divide and, 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 and put our, um, our, our culture in something that's manageable, something that they can manage inside their head <clears throat> and because something went unchallenged for a while does not mean that it was ever true so you know we have these uh, you know during this you were saying the 19th century late 19th century early 20th century we had these stories about this and people of color couldn't just walk up and say excuse me you're wrong my great-grandmother was not that person um, my great-grandmother didn't do that you're wrong you're, they were, there was no voice these people mm -hmm. were, were these people were worried about surviving Okay, uh, they weren't. They didn't have the time to pick up the pieces, and and uh, and a lot of them didn't have uh, access to education uh, uh, to where they. Can, some of them, I would say, uh, in New Orleans, of course, we've always had educated people of color, but some of these other uh, people ha uh, did not have the the time or resources to write memoirs or or to collect in a constructive way the true history of their people and even if they did have the opportunity to do that the exposure was limited so even in their, their ability to reach other people and so i think some of our own people began to read these stories and they became ashamed thinking oh well that's all we are but that's not who we are we've never been that and we've we've always been a mighty people our a resilient people and the people who have worked for what we uh, what we have and we've always been a people who wanted better for our children and our children, we were never going to send them into the lion's den. Mm -hmm. It's not something that we would have ever done. I mean, you know. Yeah, and I mean, like I say, uh, it's. Uh, uh, I, I think we should. We we'll we'll leave it at that. I think uh, you you summed it up in a, in a great way. Uh, we'll we'll talk again soon. Um, and um, you know, I appreciate it, Jeremy. We'll 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 think of another topic pretty soon, and and okay. and, and have this kind of conversation again. All right, take care, guy. All right. All right. Thank you. Bye.